Hello and welcome to the next video. And now we're getting into um, analysis of variance. So this is uh, what we call an ANOVA, or some will say an ANOVA analysis, where we're testing for the equality across multiple population means. So generally speaking, we would use an ANOVA uh, method for a minimum of three population means. You can do it if you only have two, but a two population t-test is much simpler. So we would use an ANOVA analysis if I have three treatments or more, as many as we want, five, six, seven, 12, whatever. Okay, so we've got a null hypothesis that states there's no difference across all of these different treatments. The alternative is simply that uh, at least one of them is different. At least one mean is different. And this is an important detail uh, because a common mistake that students will make is in that alternative. They'll want to say something like this, that mu1 is not equal to mu, oops, mu2 not equal to mu4. And this is a common mistake because this w appears consistent with other types of tests for equality that you've done, whether it's an F-test or a T-test. This would be what you would expect to see on the alternative. For the ANOVA, though, it's a little bit different. It's possible, yes, that all of our treatments, all of our samples are different. That's absolutely a possible outcome. But that's not necessarily what we are testing for right now. What we are testing for right now is to see whether or not at least one of them is different and not all of them are equal. So when we perform this test in Microsoft Office, it's incredibly quick. And so because it's incredibly quick, this video has the potential to be very short, but I'm going to make it a little bit longer because if we reject if our evidence supports the alternative, at least one mean is different. Well, what is the obvious next question? Which one is different or which ones are different? Maybe only one is different, maybe two, maybe three, maybe they're all different. And so in order to identify where the difference lies, we're going to perform a Fisher's LSD, Fisher's least significant difference. Now Excel doesn't have an easy, simple tool to perform a Fisher's LSD. We're still gonna use Excel, but we're gonna to have to enter in some commands uh, and do it a little bit more manually um, as opposed to the ANOVA itself, which goes very, very fast, okay? So let's jump into uh, our data set here. So here I'm working with a, a data set. I've got three treatments, three, uh, sorry, four treatments, four samples. Again, I don't have any context in these videos, I'm focusing only on how to get the results. We're not talking anything about interpretation of those results here. We're just going through the step-by-step the -step procedure of how to get our results in Excel. So I've got my four samples. If I'm gonna perform an ANOVA, we're gonna use the same tool as we've used in the last couple of videos. I'm coming up to data analysis. You'll see right at the top of that list, we've got three ANOVAs. What we're doing now is a single factor ANOVA. You may have talked about in class a, a experimental design, an observational design, or an observational study. These are two variants of what is called a completely randomized design, which is just another way of describing a single factor ANOVA. We will consider these other two. I'll do separate videos for these ones a two-factor with replication. This is what we would call a factorial ANOVA where we're testing also for interaction. This one, two-factor without replication. This is similar to, but a little bit different from what we talk about in class is a randomized block ANOVA. So we'll talk more about those in, in other videos. Here, we're just gonna be looking at this simple single-factor ANOVA and I'll hit OK, and you'll see a dialog box um, that looks familiar, but maybe even a little bit simpler than some of the previous uh, exercises that we've done. When we're looking at the tests on two population variances, two population means, you may recall I put a fair bit of emphasis on making sure you define your terms 
in your test formulation, because that determined if you're doing a lower tail or upper tail test, you had to really properly define your terms. And then in Excel, you would enter variable one and variable two consistent with how you have defined your terms. So a small detail there, but very important. Now it doesn't matter. You should still define your terms as a formality. And when if you have to do a Fisher's LSD, it becomes much easier um, to interpret your results if you've got all of your terms properly labeled. But here, it's just asking for my input range. It's as generic as the descriptive statistics command that you would have used at the start of your assignment or, or certainly the first or second video in this series um, that I've produced. All I'm doing here is selecting that entire range. Notice I'm also picking up the labels. Always, I always pick up the labels. Otherwise, Excel just makes up its own labels. Column one, column two, column three, meaningless. Here, I'll put in, um, I'll select those labels. Because I selected those labels, I need to make sure I tick this box. Again, if you don't select your labels, don't tick this box. If you do select your labels and you don't tick this box, you're going to get an error. Okay, so make sure everything you do here is consistent. I did choose my labels, I need to click this box. Alpha, this is just my level of significance. This is probably given to you in your problem. All this does is ensure you've got the appropriate critical value in your results. It doesn't really affect any of the calculations. It doesn't affect any of the results, except it, it allows Excel to provide the correct critical value in your ANOVA. Output, uh, tell it where to go. I always like to have it on the same page. Uh, you might want to have it in a different sheet, whatever, is, whatever you prefer. I'll put it just right here, and away we go. And just like that. These ANOVAs, if you did them in class, probably takes 10, 15 minutes to get one done. Thankfully, Excel does it in just a fraction of the time. I like to clean it up always to one or two decimals, three decimals maximum. If you know your detail, your, your, your numbers are very small and you need that extra bit of detail, but generally speaking, two, two or three decimals is plenty. Now, my students, I don't ever need this as part of your, your results. If you're doing this in my class, you would have already included a table of descriptive statistics. You would have already talked about the table of descriptive statistics. I don't need to see it again here. What I would like to see is that complete ANOVA table. It might seem excessive in previous problems. If you're doing an F test, a T test, really all you need, all I would expect to see is a P value, maybe a test statistic. And here I've got that P value and that test statistic. With these ANOVA studies, it's common practice to include the complete ANOVA table as part of your results. So I would ask my students to copy and paste this complete table into their document um, as part of their results. You may choose to change these labels if you wish. Um, in my class, I generally refer to this as treatments and this as error. Not a deal breaker. Uh, it's not really the end of the world. If you don't change those, it doesn't really matter, but I'll change them here just so they're consistent with how my students would see them in the classroom. So that's it for ANOVA, we're done. We've got everything, we've got more than we need here. Uh, I've got a test statistic, I've got my p-value, the ANOVA goes into my document, here I can draw my conclusion. Now, with that being said, if all you need to do in your assignment and your problem is an ANOVA, then boom, you're done. However, we can take this a step further. Because in this data set, here I can see I'm going to reject my null hypotheses. I've got a p-value that is less than 0 0.02. So that means my, my exposure to a type 1 error is less than what I'm comfortable with. I'm comfortable with a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. My risk of committing a type 1 error here is 2% with some rounding error. I'll take that risk. So I'm going to reject, which means we come back here, at least one of those means is different, or not all of them are equal. 
And so because not all of them are equal, because at least one of them is different, we now want to find out, well, which one, which ones are different. So for that, we're going to do a Fisher's LSD. Okay. Now, there's no easy command here in Excel to do the Fisher's LSD. I'm going to use what I refer to in my class as the critical value approach, where my test statistic for the Fisher's LSD is just the absolute value of the difference between two sample means. My critical value for this test is what we refer to as just the LSD, the least significant difference. And here this is that critical T alpha divided by two with so many degrees of freedom times the square root of MSE times one over NI and NJ. Now, once more, I am focusing in these videos on just how to get the results from Excel. If you're, if you have questions about these formulas, if you have questions about the process of Fisher's LSD, then I've got another series of videos that correspond to my workbooks that talk about that in, in much more depth, okay? Here, I'm not gonna talk about these formulas or how this test works, only to say that we need to input these formulas into Excel so that we get the results that we want, okay? And our rejection rule, of course, is that if that test statistic is greater than or equal to that Fisher's LSD, then we are going to reject, okay? And if you need more information about why that is, again, I'll refer you to my other videos that correspond with uh, statistics workbook number two. Uh, this would be in module 13 of that workbook. Okay, so let's jump back into Excel and input uh, our values here. So I'd like to keep things well labeled so that I can keep track of everything. So here's my test statistic. And over here, we'll put our LSD. So the test statistic, again, I'm gonna enter these formulas. So I need to start with the equal sign. And I just want the absolute value of the difference between my sample means. So that command is just ABS for absolute value. And now it's asking for, for my numbers. So what I want is the absolute value between my sample means. Now I'm gonna actually back up a little bit because I also wanna keep track of all of the different pairs right? And, and again, if you need more explanation on just exactly what I'm doing here, make sure you go back and look at those videos in Statistics Workbook 2, Module 13. Here I'm comparing those different samples, right? I'm going to compare sample A and B, A and C, A and D, B and C, B and D, and finally C and D. So we're going through all of the possible pairs of samples so that we can find where the differences exist. Now for my test statistic equals absolute. So I uh, here I'm comparing samples A and B. I'm gonna look at, at the average of A minus the average of B and there it is. Now, different ways you can do this depending on what you're comfortable with. You can enter in that command individually six times for all of those. What I like to do, sometimes I find it might be a little bit faster. I'm just gonna drag this down, but they're all wrong because it's also dragged all of my cell references. So what I prefer to do, and this is a preference thing, it's up to you. You can enter that command six times if you're more comfortable with that, is I just like to come in here and now update my cell references. So here I'm comparing A and C. So I just need to move this one up. And now it's A and C. This one here is comparing A and D. So I'm just gonna move this one up and that's done, okay? This next one here I'm looking, this is B and C. So I need to move this to B and move this one to C. This one is B and D. So I'm gonna move this one up to B, up to D. And finally, this is C and D. So I'm just gonna move this one up to C and D. 
Okay, and that's it. So there's my test statistics. Okay. Now the LSD, this one's a little bit more tricky. I'm going to go equals again. Now I need that critical value, that T value. I'm going to use the command T dot INV is going to give me a critical T that corresponds to here. As soon as I open the bracket, it's asking me for those inputs, a probability. Now this command, we have to make sure we know what these commands are doing. This returns the left tailed inverse of the T distribution. So left tailed, this is giving me a lower tailed value. Now what I want is that T alpha divided by two. So if my alpha is 0 0.05, then I need that critical T that corresponds to 0 0.025, right? If alpha is 0 0.05, alpha divided by two is 0 0.025. So this needs to be the probability that I put into this inverse command. So this is going to be 0 0.025. And oops, and then I need degrees of freedom. And of course, degrees of freedom sometimes a little bit tricky. Here are the degrees of freedom that corresponds with MSE. So I'll just pick this one here. Um, you can either select that cell or you can enter it manually. Entering it manually in this case might be a little bit easier. Often I tell students not to enter things manually because you can sometimes encounter some rounding mistakes some rounding error. But for degrees of freedom, there's no rounding error because it's always um, whole integers. If you use a, a, a cell reference, then you have to make sure that you lock it in because I'm going to be dragging this command down. L let me show you what, what's going to happen here. So if I use this cell reference and I'm not done entering the, the formula yet, I'm just going to show you what is a common mistake here. So, so that's giving me an, a negative 1.98. The reason it's negative is because this command is giving me a lower tailed value. And so that's a negative value. If you want your LSD to stay positive because I'm comparing it here against absolute values, well, we can change it into a positive by either just taking the absolute value of it, or you can make it a negative, or you can put in that probability 0.975. So then you've got that upper tail value. So here I've got that LSD. Now watch what happens if I drag this down. It gives me a whole bunch of errors. And it's because I used a cell reference. And it's dragged that value down. So if you use cell references, sometimes you want to lock those in. And so I'm going to use here on on my iMac, I have to use the function key uh, and F4. If you're using a Windows PC, you just need to hit F4. And you'll see it puts in these little dollar signs. So the dollar sign here locks in the column, locks in column I, and the dollar sign here locks in row 16. And so now when I drag it down, you'll see it, it has not changed that cell reference because I've locked it in there, okay? So let's, um, let's finish this off because that's only the critical value we still need that square root with the MSE. So this T value, I'm going to multiply this, I'm going to open another bracket, I need MSE, which is here, I'm going to lock that in as well. So that when I drag this command, it doesn't change that cell reference, MSE times one divided by n. Now luckily for us, sample sizes are the same for each of our four treatments. So I'm just going to enter in 26. Or if you wanted to use cell references, you can use cell references here too. If you're doing this with samples that are different size, then you have to make sure that you change that sample size for each LSD, so that the, the sample sizes correspond with the two samples that you're comparing. Here, they're all 26. So I'm going to just enter it in manually. Now let's make sure we have all of our brackets closed, that should do it. 
something is off, I know it is off, I need my square root, S-Q-R-T, to give me that square root of MSE times all of those um, ratios. Okay, this is perhaps one of the more tedious calculations, one of the more tedious formulas to put in. Hopefully it's clear, you can pause the video and you can work through this. Hopefully you can see all of my cell references, they're just fine. SQRT is what's giving me the square root of MSE times one over N and one over N, okay? So I've got that, I can drag that down. I locked in my cell references so it didn't mess anything up. Now I can get my conclusions. And this is simply, do you reject or not? And remember our rejection rule is only if the test statistic is greater than your LSD, you reject. So I'm just comparing these two numbers. Is it greater than? No, I'm not gonna reject that one. I will, that one I will not, that one I will not, that one I also will not, this one I will. Good. And so that's it. So now I've got all of my conclusions for, in this case, my six tests. Whoops. What I would generally ask my students to do is to focus on um, these results as a whole, not so much to talk to me about each of these tests you know, that uh, these two are different, these two are different, and the rest are the same. Generally, I would want a, an interpretation that looks at all of the conclusions together and, and explains what you have found. And in, in this context, it can be a little bit tricky because, well, it, it gets trickier as you have more and more um, samples to work with. But a little trick that I have to hopefully sort it out uh, is the following. I like to write down my, my treatments, my samples, from, lar from, sorry, from smallest to largest sample mean, and then I can see where the breaks occur, where, the, where the differences um, exist. So if I do that here, so I go from C, sample C is my smallest, to B, to D, and to A. So if I just come back into here, and so I have C, B, D, and A. So I'm just writing down my sample means from smallest to largest. Now I come over here and I see, okay, where are the differences? Which ones are, are similar? And so I can see I'm rejecting on A and C and C and D. A and C are different and C and D are different. So if I come over here, I see that A and C are different and D and C are different. So I've got a break between D and B. However, D and B are found to not be statistically different from each other. So that is what I mean when I can when we say we've got some some complications here. It's not always clear what the results are going to be. So what this means is that we are unable to, to, to find a statistically significant difference between samples C and B. And we are unable to find a statistically significant difference between B, D, and A. So B is the one that is a little bit unsure. We can't distinguish it from either sample C or from sample D. So really I've got two distributions here and we are unable to determine which distribution sample B came from. So once more, I can't provide a great deal of interpretation into this. I'm not working within a context of any particular problem, but these are the types of results that you can encounter. Hopefully, if you're working on an assignment, you have results that are a little bit more clear than this, but it is what it is given this particular data set. So that's it. 
you've got your single factor ANOVA done. We found here that we were rejecting the null hypotheses, which meant that we had reason to go ahead and perform Fisher's LFD to find out where the difference exists. We've gone through here, we've got Fisher's LSD is done. Again, we don't need so many decimal places here, that's fine. Um, my students, I would not want to see this in your table. This is messy. You know, Microsoft Excel, this is scrap paper. I would want to see uh, a little bit more clarity using some words and, and proper, proper labels proper names to make it a little more clear what it is you're talking about. But here we've got all of the results that we need. You've got enough information here to draw your conclusions and based on the context of the problem, hopefully you can wrap your head around how to interpret those, uh, those uh, results. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope that this was helpful. Take care, bye-bye.